Did you know that it's only the female mosquito that bites you? No male mosquitoes bite you. Now, I'm not saying anything about male, female. It's just a, a biological fact. Only the female mosquitoes suck human blood. And that is only right around the time when they're getting ready to be pregnant or during pregnancy. Don't you find that peculiar? The male looks just like the female, right? Same proboscis, same nose to poke the hypodermic needle. Then you might think, well, what's the man do? What does the male mosquito do? Does he starve? No. What do you think the male eats? He sucks the juice of plants. He pokes the, the skin of plants and sucks. So now, can creationists come up with the very easy hypothesis, what would make a female mosquito be driven to suck human blood when they were maybe, probably, more likely than not, designed to suck plants? And indeed, the males all uh, drink plant juice, and the females generally do until, until it's time for uh, procreation. How about the flood? There was no more, there was no more food for them. And it's either suck human blood, the only thing available, even though it's not designed to do that, or die. And the urge to live easily could have shifted them over. Uh, how about the king of the jungle, which they don't even live in jungles, uh, they live in plains, but the lion. Well, how can, how can uh, God make a lion to be vegetarian? Right now, lions eat they're carnivores, right? You don't need to show me how many carnivore lions there are. All I need to do is show you one lion that is vegetarian. Go home and Google little tyke lion vegetarian. The sweetest little story. It was almost killed by its mother when it was a cub. After that, it would not eat anything that had blood in it. And the and its master kept trying to feed it meat and blood because veterinarians were telling him, it's going to die if you don't. And then one day a friend came by and he was sharing with him his dilemma. And he said, well, that, that makes sense. And he said, what do you mean? And he took, said, read Genesis 1.30. So he went home and read that. At that, mo at that, that day, he quit trying to force feed that animal the traditional diet and fed it a vegetarian diet. That lion grew up to live as long or longer. And guess what, guess what that diet did to his personality? The aggressiveness, there was none. In fact, it would, it would just walk around in the farm with chickens and dogs and cats. Uh, it would cuddle up. It was so uh, sensitive that when thunder, uh, when it heard thunder, it would jump into the, the arms of his master. Okay? You've got to believe diet drives aggressiveness. Uh, I, we don't have time to go into all of the, uh, the experiments that were done in prisons where they fed half of the prison a healthier diet and the other half just a regular junk food, regular prison diet. I've never been in prison I don't, if you have, I'm sure you would recommend don't go there. The food's probably not that great. But uh, the regular prison diet versus the healthy prison diet, see what happened to the, to the aggressive aggression and the uh, interracial relationships. It's amazing. It cut it down uh, so that when the guards, when they, when they would hear an alarm go off that there's a fight, they could predict that 90% of the time it was coming from the regular diet side. Only 10% of the time it was coming from the uh, healthy diet side. So animals were designed to be vegetarian at the beginning, okay? So according to God, this is the chart. Now, you might, you now have a uh, benchmark, and you, 
to compare all other diets. Remember, I promised you that you would have a benchmark. And uh, at the end, we have a handout of the summary sheet here so for uh, each of you that we'll give. But you might think, well, Dr. Yim, that's all fine and good, but what if, what if uh, we've evolved faster so that our diet's different now? Um, or what if God's not real? What if God's not true? And I'm sure uh, you pastors could vouch for this. Many people in the congregation go through times in their life where they question, right, the existence of God. Maybe God's not there. Maybe our diet should be different. Okay? I'm going to give you now modern-day proof that this diet is true. When you go home tonight and you're watching the evening news, you know, they have these health segments, right? Maybe it's on CNN and Sanjay Gupta is going to come out. Okay, have you ever heard on the, on the health segment that th them say, doctors have just discovered a new vitamin in country ham that makes you live long? <laughs> it's laughable, right? Or scientists have just discovered a new antioxidant in fried chicken that will kill cancer. You never hear that, right? What is it always? Blueberries, the superfood, right? Or uh, a couple years ago, remember, it was the pomegranate craze? They were putting pomegranates in everything, right? Skin creams and uh, lotions. You're supposed to eat it, right? But anyway, we went crazy about it, put it everywhere. Uh, now it's the acai berry, or some, some people say the acai berry, but it's the acai berry. 50 times more antioxidant than oranges, okay? Isn't it curious? These are, these are atheists on television telling us this. These are scientists who don't believe in God, why is it always the fruits and the and why is it always the plants? Why does it, why is it never the high fat greasy diet? If indeed we've evolved so quickly, if indeed God's not really there, they're just making observation that this is the best diet for us. I've got a whole another presentation called the Blue Zones, the groups in the world that live the longest and healthiest. Why is it always the plants? They're eating heavy, heavy plants. Think about that. That's modern-day proof that this diet still sticks. So now you have a standard and a benchmark with which to compare all of the diets with. This diet has been the foundation for at least 6,000 years. It hasn't changed. It hasn't come and gone with the fads. So you have a benchmark, and you might say, well, Dr. Yim, if I'm on this diet, won't I become weak and malnourished? You know, I hear that sometimes. Um, actually, the closer we come to God's diet, the better we'll be. See, uh, in the wilderness, now, I, today I'm going to present to you three perfect diets. The, that was the main one. But in the Bible, did you know that there are three perfect diets? And that's what we're looking for, right, is the perfect diet. That first one was perfect. Why? Well, first of all, God gave it to them with his hand, and it was at creation. So that's the first perfect diet. The second perfect diet God gave to the Israelites in the wilderness by his hand, right? God gave the Israelites water to drink from the rock. And if some of you want to do some fascinating study, go home and do a, a, a real in-depth study on that rock. <coughs> do a study on that rock. Many theologians actually believe that that rock followed them and provided the water for them. Can you imagine supernatural water? Can you imagine the minerals it would have in it? And what did he give them to eat? Manna bread. Well, God's not very smart. He gave them the worst food, bread, carbs. No, God knew what he was doing. He gave them bread to eat, manna bread to eat. And he brought along with it promises. He said, and you shall serve the Lord your God, and you sh he shall bless thy bread and thy water, and I will take sickness away from the midst of thee. Deuteronomy 7 goes even further and says, and the Lord will take away from thee all sickness and will put none of the evil diseases of Egypt upon thee. Evil diseases of Egypt. That's another interesting thing to research. Go home and Google ancient Egypt diseases. And do you, what do you think that they were dying of? The same things we're dying of today. 
heart attack, cancer, and then some other things that we're not dying of today, uh, such as, you know, infections from the river and such. We have antibiotics, right? But they were dying of the same things we are dying of, and you got to think, what were they eating? And then when God took them out of that environment and took them into the wilderness and fed them with his own fruit, food, the bread and the water, diseases went away. And when you look at the blue zones, that substantiates it also. They're drinking water and they're eating plants. So, won't I become weak and malnourished? Won't I become uh, puny? Well, here's a short list of famous vegetarians, okay? There's uh, Einstein. He tops the list. Not very smart, right, these uh, vegetarians. Uh, Martina Navratilova, right? Tennis champ. Uh, Hank Aaron, Jack LaLanne, Billie Jean King, Joe Namath, Carl Lewis, uh, Benjamin Franklin, Sir Isaac Newton. So I don't need to prove to you that this diet is better, friends. We've got it easy today. You know, you don't need to follow this diet by faith. Do you know why? We, we follow it by sight. What does the Bible say faith is? The substance of things not seen, right? We're seeing it. We don't need faith to follow this diet. Scientists are telling us to do this. The atheists are telling us to do this. And did you know that Christians on the polls, the Christians are the least healthy group in the world. Christians are less healthy than the atheists. This should not be friends. How are we going to witness to them if we're less healthy than them? What do we have to offer them? You see? Imagine 100 years ago or 150 years ago when you wanted to follow God's diet, you were reading the Bible and you are thinking, hey, you know, this is the way God wants us to eat. Imagine how hard it was to follow God's diet. That was the times of walking by faith, friends. 100, 150 years ago when the doctors were telling patients, fresh air is bad for you, especially at night. Oh, close the, close the. If you're sick, they're going to hole you up in a room and close off all the doors. You're just breathing, recycling that dirty air, all the germs. They were saying that fruits and vegetables are just an unimportant part of the diet. They said what you really needed was heavy foods and spicy foods. Little did they know that the reason that the people were getting more uh, awake from the spicy foods because it's such an irritant. They were getting so agitated from it. Um, they were saying water is not very good. Wine is better or tea is better. Friends, we've got it easy today. They were, they were putting patients in bed and not even letting them exercise, saying that that was harmful for them. Leeches. We talked about leeches. And if you wanted to follow God's diet in those days, imagine how much faith it took to go by the Word of God rather than the inventions of man. And have the, has man's counsel stood? No. Every 10 to 20 years, it changes. The medical community changes what they recommend. Remember for diabetics, like 30 years ago, it was uh, high-carb, low-fat. Then it was high-protein, low-carb. And then now it's back to high-carb, low-fat. Friends, just follow God's diet and just wait for them to come around, okay? So the closer we come to God's diet, the better we'll be. Those were the days of living by faith. So when, tonight when you leave, we'll all just leave here and we know what to do now. We're all going to eat healthy, right? I wish it were that easy, <laughs> You know, I, I've thought many times as I'm thinking, how, am, how can I best change this person's lifestyle so that they'll be healthier? Uh, many patients come in and say, Doc, I wish I could get off these pills. I'm so tired of taking all these pills. Okay. Why is it so hard for us to change? And now I'm going to draw upon a spiritual principle that we can apply to this physical dilemma. As it is in the spiritual, so it is in the physical. It, Apostle Paul says, by beholding, we become changed. What he's talking about is we should turn our eyes upon Jesus. We should look upon Him daily, right? And as we do that, we're going to become more and more like Him. 
Don't look at the, don't look at the enemy. Don't look at all the bad things. Look at the good, and we'll become more and more like that. That's the principle. And do parents know this? Why do we not want our kids to watch bad things, right? Everyone knows this. By beholding, we become changed. Who you hang around, that's who you're going to become like. The difference between who you are now and who you will be five years from now depends on only two things, friends, the books you read and the friends you make. That quote was said about 100 years ago, so nowadays it would be the books you read, which would be the TV you look at or the movies you look at or the music you listen to, all the media, and the friends you make. Choose your friends wisely, but more importantly, choose what you're going to look at wisely. So, how does this apply to physical? Well, you come to the doctor. I've got 10 minutes a year on your physical, right, to go over some, oh, hey, you know, drink water. Um, you know, you're drinking a lot of Cokes right now, uh, three to six Cokes a day. We add up the calories, and then they say, oh, no, doc, but I'm drinking diet. We just went over diet Coke, right? Uh, that's even worse. But, uh, you know, I've got 10 minutes to work with you per year, and then you go home, and every day in front of the television, you're getting scores of commercials. And like I told you, uh, have mercy on me. I'm just an erring human. I'm doing my, the best I can. But McDonald's and Burger King and Pizza Hut, they've got full-time professional psychologists and food scientists whose only job, their full-time job, is to tweak their food just a little bit more so that it's that much more addictive. If you don't believe me, just ask any insider. That's what they do. They, most of the food is not really even food. It's got artificial coloring, flavoring, texture ingredients that are not even part of the food. I had a friend who had an illustration. He bought French fries, okay? He, he brought a jar of French fries, McDonald's fries, and he put them up on here, and he said, guess how old those are? Now, they look like brand new fries. He had a receipt there from eight years ago. There was no mildew. There was no mold. There was no germs. Friends, the, the natural world knows that it's not food. It's got so much artificial stuff in it. Okay. So here, I've got 10 minutes with you, and then all year long, you're getting thousands of brainwashing. Friends, we got to cut that off. I don't stand a chance. God doesn't stand a chance. Well, maybe he does. How much time do you spend in the Word? Per day. Let's bump that up and let's cut down the enemy, right? Every year, thousands of brainwashing commercials. I recommend to my patients who have just got to watch media, I say, look, just turn off the TV and just watch movies. At least there are no commercials on there. At least you're not selling your brain for free. You think you're doing it, you, oh, it's, hey, TV is free. It comes at a price. You're selling your mind, you're selling your time. You're selling your spending habits, and you think that they're spending billions of dollars on advertising because it doesn't work. They know what they're doing, friends. They know your brain. They know your psychology and my psychology better than we do. We can't let them in the door. Don't let them even get the foot in the door. So that's one of the, that's one of the reasons I came upon why it's so hard to change people's behavior because after I get through telling them how to eat, now they're getting brainwashed on this side, and then... They get in this urge. Did you know that they already know it's a pure numbers game, friends? They know it's a pure numbers game. My accountant told me that Coke, when they come out with a new product, they already know that the average person, if they flicker, if they sh flick that commercial in front of them or the billboard or the magazine ad, after about 43 times, 50% of us are going to go out there and try it. What is it for them? It's a no-lose no situation. All they do is just get bombard you. And we're here thinking, I get some patients come and say, oh, I'm a Coke kind of guy. Oh, no, no, I'm, I'm Pepsi. I'm from, I'm, I came down here from Baltimore. I'm a Pepsi kind of guy. No, you're not. You only like that 
because when you were little and impressionable, your uncle, when, who you hardly ever saw, but you really looked up to him, on Thanksgiving, maybe you guys got together, and on the front porch, you, the uncle was standing there swaggering and saying, son, real man, drink Coke. And ever since then, you want to be a real man, and so you're thinking Coke's the thing for you. And every time you drink it, you, you feel, you're psychologically feel your uncle patting you on the back. That's right, big boy. Friends. And then, you know, you're driving by. I don't know how many times it takes, but let's say it takes 20. And so think about it. If you ate pizza tonight, I don't want you to go and do that, but if you ate pizza tonight, tomorrow morning, would you be in the mood for pizza? And generally the answer is no, right? Now, as you go through the week, your brain is just a simple clicker, my friend. And so you see, a commer- you see a billboard on your way to work. When you get to work, you hear a little ad for the, the pizza. And then that night you're watching TV and you see a pizza commercial, you're clicking it up, right? Fifth time, tenth time, no, you're not in the mood for a pizza. And then all of a sudden, mysteriously, on the 20th time, you know what? I'm in the mood for a pizza. No, you're not. You've just been programmed. And how do we know this? The African Bushman, who has no TV, when is he ever in the mood for a pizza? He doesn't even know what they are. Do you understand? Clicker. One, two, and when it hits the magic number, all of a sudden, you know, I'm in the mood for that. Don't sell your mind to the business people. So meditate on that in your own life. Where do you have to cut it off? You know where the billboards are. It could be immorality, friends, impurity, impure thoughts. It could be food addictions. It could be gambling addictions. In other states, they have gambling, uh, and even here, they have gambling uh, billboards, right? If that's your weakness, confess that to the Lord and cut it off. When you're driving by it, look the other way. Put, Put up the visor over there. Don't let them make another clicker go up in your mind. So just like in our physical life, spiritual life, we need to take in Jesus every day, right? We need to read the Bible daily. We need to pray daily, just like our daily food. How many of you are going to forget to eat today? (laughs) Not a single one of us are going to forget to eat. Let's not forget to take in spiritual food too every day. Friends, uh, Jesus spiritually said, the water I give him will become in him a spring of water welling up, welling up to eternal life. Jesus is the water of life. He's also the bread of God, right? Bread, from, bread of heaven. For the bread of God is he who comes down from heaven and gives life to the world. When they're telling you uh, that bread is bad, who would want you to believe that? That's the enemy. Now, I'll give you a hint. It is true, some bread is bad. So, one practical tip is, remember our chart? We said that fruit is what God told us to eat, right? And whole grain wheat is a seed. If you plant it, you will get a, plant, a wheat plant, right? How about if I was such a smarty pants that I got to, took it to the mill and took off the germ and the, and the husk and the fiber? Now I got a nice white kernel, right? And, and you could do it to brown rice. You know, Asians eat rice. You got white rice and brown rice. The white rice is just brown rice with the, the germ and the husk removed. If I planted that in the ground, what would grow? Nothing would grow. It's not a seed anymore, right? All it is is pure starch. Now do you understand why that there are good carbs and bad carbs? Good carbs are the ones that have the the seed and the germ and the fiber in it. The bad carbs are the ones we've taken it all out. Classically, at all the restaurants, unless they're serving whole wheat bread. Now, so the important point is get 100% whole wheat bread. And to show you how deceptive advertisers are and these uh, marketers are, how many of you have, have shopped for bread and you've seen wheat bread or honey wheat bread? Right? It's brown. When you look on the fiber, strangely, it's got less than one gram per slice. Now, why is that? Okay, if you read the ingredients, there's caramel coloring in it, 
which is brown coloring. Strange, why does whole wheat bread need to have brown coloring in it? Maybe because it's not whole wheat bread, but it's masquerading as it. But guess why they can do it? Because they're not saying it's 100% whole wheat bread. They're saying it's just wheat bread. And where did they get the flour from? From wheat. So it's not false advertising. Just don't get duped by it. Get the 100% whole wheat bread, then they can't lie about that. It has to be from 100% whole wheat. It has to have the germ and the fiber with it, you see. So if Jesus is the bread, who would want us not to eat bread when it's so good for us? You know, in the Blue Zone presentation, the Sardinians in Italy, you know when the shepherd man goes out for the day, when he leaves in the morning, do you know what he takes for lunch? Probably breakfast, lunch, and supper. Two-pound loaf of bread. That's it. Bread. Oh, he must be very unhealthy because he's just eating bread, which is about 90% carbs. It's all good carbs. So, friends, in the end, this world is going to be destroyed, right? It's going to be burned up. The Bible promises that, but the Bible also promises that God's going to recreate the new earth, right? And would you be surprised if when we get to heaven, God has a diet for us there too? This is the third and final perfect diet in the Bible. Then the angel showed me the river of the water of life as clear as crystal flowing from the throne of God down the middle of the great street of the city. On each side of the river stood the tree of life, bearing 12 crops of fruit, yielding its fruit every month. And the leaves of the tree were, are for the healing of the nations. Wow. I want to eat of that uh, fruit. I want to drink that pure water from that river of life, don't you? So, we've completed our journey from Genesis to Revelation. And we come to the end, which is really the beginning of the rest of your life. We've learned God's diet, and we've also learned that the evolution theory supports it. And we've also learned that there's no third or fourth alternative. You now have a benchmark to leave from here and compare all other diets by and know whether it's right or wrong, whether it's truth or the, what the Bible calls the inventions of man.